webinar with Hacker Earth, and I'm very happy to have uh, Miss Amy Miller with me today from Google. She's the senior technical recruiter at Google, and we're all very glad to have her for this session with us. And it's actually uh, a big thing to have such a great personality, such a great influence for our webinar series at Hacker Earth. So guys, please, uh, I, uh, I would just like to introduce you guys to the uh, platform as well. In the panel, we have a questions tab. Uh, you can openly ask your questions throughout the session. Please keep the questions coming in. Uh, you can also tweet us at hashtag Amy at Hacker Earth on Twitter or LinkedIn. So you can either ask your questions in the tab in the panel or else uh, maybe you could use social media as well. So Amy, we can start off now. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arvaz, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're going to hope that the technology works in my favor because I'm the least technical tech recruiter on the planet, but that's okay. I have some great tips for you guys. And uh, so we're going to get started here in just a sec. I want to first of all thank Arvaz and the team at Hacker Earth. Really appreciate you guys providing this platform for us to have this conversation. Uh, these guys are, you know, doing technical assessments and helping poor recruiters like me figure it all out. Uh, because again, not the technical expert, but I am the recruiting expert. So hopefully you get something good out of this conversation today. We are going to take your questions throughout the 45 minutes. So please drop them in the chat window, raise your hand. Our boss is going to be kind of following along and watching for that and following those hashtags. So I'm um, really looking forward to a great conversation with you guys. So I'm going to share. So we'll start off with the poll, Amy, first. Okay. Yes, yes, poll, poll question first. <laughs> Start off with a poll question, guys. The first question out there, a very easy one, or maybe not the most easiest one for most of the recruiters around the globe. Tech recruiting, a big, big issue for all organizations across. So, come on, guys, let's vote. And if you're saying no to this, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I would like to understand your secrets. <laughs> okay, so last 10 seconds, guys. Keep them coming. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we're done. So, right. yes. How'd we do? With Amy's presentation now, uh, I'll sign off. I'll keep a hand on the question. And please excellent questions throughout the session. And over to you, Amy. Good luck, all the best. Excellent. Thank you so much. So yeah, let me uh, let me figure out how to share this deck here. Here we go. Present. You all feel a lot better about all the presentations you've ever done, don't you? <laughs> all right, Arbaz, are we good? You guys can see my screen, okay? Yes, we can see your screen. I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. So thanks again for joining. Again, this uh, this webinar is all about successfully recruiting the most in-demand tech talent on the planet. I stand by that. A um, couple of things that I wanted to share with you jumping in. A lot of you know me already. I know a lot of my friends are in the audience. Well, thank you for joining. But um, a little bit about me. If you've not met me before, you're curious, why is this crazy lady on here talking about this? This stuff. Um, I've been in recruiting for 20 years. So since the 90s, handing out paper applications was a wild time. Things have definitely changed. Um, I also uh, write uh, pretty regularly on my personal blog, recruitinginyogapants.com. I am currently wearing yoga pants and also a snarky t-shirt, which I don't think you can see, but that's okay. Um, and honestly, I don't take a whole lot seriously, you guys. I mean, the job is serious enough, but uh, we want to make it fun. And so I hope that we can make this interactive and we can make it fun and, and still give you something valuable that y'all can take right back to your desk tomorrow and, and start employing uh, to make this job just a little bit easier and hopefully more fun. 
So for today's purposes, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to probably go kind of quickly to keep us on time, but please do raise your hand, ask questions, jump in. Uh, if there's anything we've not covered, I'll make sure we have an opportunity to sync up after and so more to come on that. But for today's purposes, we're talking about the full life cycle. A lot of you are probably full life cycle recruiters, meaning that you're owning the requisition from start to finish. You might be doing your own candidate generation and your own sourcing you're probably managing the interview process making offers and hopefully closing so we're going to talk a little bit about all of that if there are specific sections that you want to go deeper on or have questions raise those hands put those questions in the chat um, or otherwise again we'll sync up after so what does this mean what is the talent market really like uh, it's brutal. I think that's a given. I was playing around a little bit with uh, with some data and looking at some numbers and come to find that, uh, check this a few different places, and for software developers, for the engineers that most of us are going after, unemployment is at 1.3%. I think we all know the job market is super tight, unemployment is super low anyway in most cases even more so for engineers, uh, which didn't surprise me exactly, but to see a number like that and to see like black and white, that link uh, with that level of detail was, was kind of surprising. Uh, so I wanted to take it a step further. Okay, so there's not a lot of them unemployed. That's definitely one key piece of information. Um, how many people are hiring them? And so I decided to pick on San Francisco because that's where I am hunting as well. And I said, gosh, how many engineer roles are open in San Francisco, I wonder? This is literally a 30 second research project. I just went to a particular job aggregator site and found over 10,000 roles that fit pretty general engineering criteria. 10,000 in San Francisco. Um, pretty shocking. I played with some other job titles just to see a comparison. We only have about 1,400 for receptionists. I think there were something like 600 for dishwashers. And so you can kind of plug and play with a variety of non-tech roles and see a massive gap between the talent that we're all going after and all the different flavors that engineers and developers come in and then just the more general job market and, and other critical but yet non-technical roles. So uh, super interesting and uh, did give me, um, I'm going to name an ulcer after this unemployment rate, I think, because it's pretty crazy. Um, on average, this is anecdotal Amy Miller experience, so your mileage may vary, but I did some quick figuring over the last few years. I was at Microsoft before Google for several years, so I've been in tech for, for quite a while now. And just thinking back in the last few years and, and kind of mentally reviewing the folks that I've hired or who have turned me down unfortunately. Um, on average, every single person I've made an offer to has had at least four offers in hand. So one for me, typically three from competing off, uh, from competing companies, the usual suspects, of course, uh, competing with, with big tech, but also any number of startups, nonprofits, uh, privately held companies. I mean, everybody with few exceptions is hiring technical talent. So what's a recruiter to do? How do we stand out? How do we uh, make this crazy market work for us? Um, this is a super interesting chart. Uh, there is a source link here, so we'll make sure we can get you guys the slides and the, and the detail that goes with this. But this was fascinating to me, and I, and I wanna really level set on this concept because it's, it's something called the law of diminishing returns. So I don't know if you've heard of this. I, I think I heard about it one time and thought, oh, that's interesting. I want to know more. And so in digging through this and prepping for this presentation, I realized that this does have serious recruiting implications or sourcing implications. Um, one way to look at this and how I'm choosing to interpret it right or wrong, apologies to the source code, uh, source, um, is we can do the math and we can say, okay, to get one person to an offer, I have to talk to 20 people. So that's initial reach out, screening, getting them, whatever it is, you know, you all know your funnel. But to, to get to one hire, I've got to have 20 people engaged. So the math would say, great, so if I want two hires, I need to talk to 40 people. And if I need three hires, it's going to be 60. And if I need 10 hires, it's going to be 200. 
And what happens, I firmly believe, is that the more input, the more emails you're sending, emails, cold calls, carrier pigeons, whatever your thing is to get the attention of these engineers, the lower your output really is. So we go from maybe 20 clearly personalized, which I'm going to get into, really great outgoing messages that get that one person. And now we're at 200 expecting it to get 10. And the reality is you're probably not because you're working in bulk, you're sending massive messages, they start looking like spam. So you're, it's actually working against you a little bit. So I want to talk about doing less with and getting more return. So starting with outreach. This is for my sourcers on the call. This is for those full life cycle recruiters who maybe don't have robust sourcing support or in cases like mine, I've got an amazing sourcing team, but sometimes I have these weird, really niche roles that I have to manage and I have to kind of figure out um, how to get people engaged. So the number one thing, you have to know what you're selling and it's going to be different for every company. It's going to be different for every recruiter, for every role. Um, there's a lot of things we can pick apart here so I'm going to try to take some time on this slide and um, certainly if there's questions jump in raise your hand let me know so we can address those but really understand what it is that I'm selling I remember years and years and years ago my boss telling me about this radio station called WIIFM and I thought it, he was nuts I didn't know what he was talking about but most of you have heard of this What's in it for me? This is the frequency that everyone on the planet is tuned into most of the time. So when you're doing an outreach, and so when you're sending that message, making that phone call, especially for engineers and technical talent, they're really tuned into this. They really want to know, why should I talk to you? what's in it for me. I'm perfectly content in my big job, making lots of money, doing work I care about. Why should I take your call? Why should I get on the phone with you? One thing that I've learned even just recently uh, talking with en engineers and, and recruiting leaders and, and engineering leaders rather, uh, a lot of engineers hate our standard, hi, I'm a recruiter, let's talk message. Um, a lot of us, especially for my agency folks, you know, we're protecting our clients, we're protecting, we're, we're kind of holding on to some of that information and, and some of the detail about the job and we don't want to give up too much. We don't want to talk about money um, and engineers hate that. <laughs> this, is, this is not me telling you this, I am relaying what I am being told directly from candidates and clients and folks in the industry. Uh, it is actually way more valuable to them if you give them the value up front. I've had engineers say to me, I'm not gonna respond if I don't understand what it is you're asking of me. And a lot of us come from that old school place of, well, you know, I just wanna network and I just wanna be your friend. No, you don't. <laughs> it doesn't mean we can't be friendly. It doesn't mean we can't have a pleasant working relationship. But the idea that we're going to make an army of engineers our best friends and go out on the boat with them every Saturday is probably just not accurate. So I think it's important. And I think technical folks appreciate us coming from a place of, look, I'm a recruiter. I have jobs. That is the point of me reaching out to you. I have a need I'm trying to fill you look like the kind of person that might fill that need, here's the value proposition to you. That's gonna look different for everybody. I get that I am super fortunate to work for a company that has a brand. Uh, same with my previous employer. Like most people know who these companies are. Here's the downside. Most people have preconceived ideas about what those companies do and what they're building and what it's like to work there. So take the time way before you start making your list, way before you start sending emails, way before you start drafting your call list. Think about what is it that I'm selling? What song am I going to play on this station, this what's in it for me station? It's got to be something that would potentially matter to the technical people. You can pick out some of those things by their own social profile. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more, but start thinking about what do I have to offer and what of that list of value prop that I've uncovered is going to resonate with people of a certain 
type, a certain talent, whether it's leaders, whether it's university folks, whether it's uh, mid-career, you know, it depends on the audience you're going after, but really take the time to start thinking about what can I give you right out the gate? Hey, I'm not going to pretend I'm not trying to recruit you. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Maybe it's today, maybe it's six months from now, but here's what I have to offer you in exchange for a conversation. So um, also getting the right people to talk to the right people. I, for years, really kept my candidates close to the vest. I didn't want to share. I didn't want anyone else getting involved. I didn't want my hiring managers to, to see how the sausage was made. I really wanted them to just sit back and wait for me to deliver their offer, deliver their hire on a silver platter. Uh, it took me a while to really, to be frank, put aside my own ego and say, that's not working so well, is it, Amy? You're talking to 1,700 people to get to, and this is not really sustainable. So I started bringing in my hiring teams, and I started, especially in tech, and I started really saying, hey, you're going to have questions that I can't answer. I'm not a technical person. That is not my wheelhouse. I could not code if my life depended on it. What I do know is a recruiting process. What I do know is how to help you move from A to B to C to D, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, but you have technical questions. You wanna better understand what am I gonna impact by coming to write code for your company? Is there gonna be a button on the homepage that I can go home and show my grandma, hey, I built that. That's the kind of stuff that engineers wanna know. So have them talk to other engineers. Have your hiring teams involved. Have the manager CC'd on an email to a prospect. Have them ready and available for a 15 minute phone call to answer early preliminary questions. The more that we're able to include our stakeholders in this conversation, it's gonna do two big things for you. First of all, it's gonna increase your response rate quite a bit. And secondly, it's gonna lend serious credibility to your message. You're not just another recruiter who's trying to just stack your ATS. I understand for the agency folks, this is sometimes not as easy, but think about the technical advocates on your team. Think about people who can speak to uh, why this is a great organization. Maybe it's somebody that you placed at this company. You know, hey, ask Joe. Joe just took a job there that I helped him get, and he's willing to spend, you know, 10 minutes in a quick call with you to talk about the process or talk about why he's there and why he accepted. So don't be afraid to get creative and think about how do I get the right people talk to the right people. Uh, that's going to be a key differentiator for you. Hyper-personalize. Uh, this, again, goes back to that very selective outreach. I'd rather see uh, my sourcers and my recruiters write 10 carefully crafted, well thought out in-mails, emails, whatever it is, than to blast 100. Less is more in this case. If you are really taking the time to say, hey, I know you just had your third anniversary at this company. Um, my anecdotal experience, people usually start thinking about the next step in their career between years two and three at this company. Where are you at with that? Are you exploring internal stuff that might be a fit? Are you looking outside? Are you open to a conversation? You know, really understanding, hey, I recognize where you are. I recognize the stage of your career. I recognize things that you've said are important to you. You you love shelter puppies. Hey, I've got two of them. They're probably gonna run in here in any, any minute. Uh, really hyper-personalize and make a human connection. You're more likely to get them to respond. And then finally, offer help. You know, again, almost flies in the face of what I started this slide with, but um, again, we're the recruiting experts. We're the employment experts. We're the ones that understand moving us from point A to point B. So one thing that I like to do, and you have to figure out what works for you, but I like to say, hey, I don't know if Google's on your radar. I, you know, you've never spoken with us, or maybe you interviewed 10 years ago, and, and now we're revisiting for a completely different role. Um, but you know, what I can do is just answer questions. There's a lot of, of anecdotal data out there. There's a lot of myths. There's a lot of um, kind of conventional wisdom about what it's like to work here, what the interview process is. I, I know I, I work here. I recognize that that's something that uh, we get asked a lot. So, hey, I'm just here to try to demystify it. 
I, I want to try to to peel back the the layers as, as best I can um, and tell you what it's really like. So offer something in return. Uh, maybe it's you know, hey, I'm a I'm a native of you know the Twin Cities, and so if you ever thought about relocation here, even if it's not for this job, I've lived here my whole life. I could tell you anything you want to know. So think about what is a little special something that you have that you can also offer. And again, it's just part of humanizing. So I want to pause there for just a sec. Do we have any questions before I go forward? Yes, Amy. Okay. So I'll stop in now. Yes, excellent. A couple of questions. I'll start off with the first one that came in. Uh, so Scott asks us, uh, so for companies that don't have a very strong inbound draw, uh, are there any yeah. source strong tips that you would like to give them so that they can source candidates much better? Absolutely. And I will tell you that you are in an enviable position because you get to drive the narrative. Um, you get to say, hey, you know what? Nobody's heard of us. We are like the quiet little, you know, behind the scenes engine that's doing all this amazing stuff. So you get to actually drive that brand. I worked for a very small company prior uh, to, to Microsoft. Actually, this has been several years ago now. And the one thing that we had that was public information was we had absolutely horrible glass door ratings. <laughs> no one ever heard of us. No one knew exactly what we did. But if you went to glass door, boy, did you get an earful. So you're in a position to drive that narrative. So hopefully you don't have that situation. But if you do, you have the opportunity to be like, hey, this is one slice through the filter of, of maybe a not great experience. Let me actually show you start to finish what we're all about and what this looks like. So yeah, a lot more we could go on that, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of something, Scott, to work on. Um, any other questions before I move on? Yep. So we'll have one more question before we move on. Uh, great. Okay. So this question comes from well, Louise, she's asking, how do you source for niche job roles when the candidate pool is very small? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you're dealing with a super small section of the population, there's two things to keep in mind. Um, everybody else is. <laughs> so the odds that that target is going to get 17 emails the same day you're sending one is pretty good. The second thing is they're talking to each other. Um, if it's a very small pool, if they're all working for the same research lab in, you know, Northwest Idaho or something, uh, guarantee they're going to talk to each other. So you have to make it even more personal. And it's okay to say, hey, look, you're like one of a hundred people that can do this job. You know, frankly, I probably need to talk to all hundreds of you. But in the meantime, let's talk about you. So being really transparent and open and upfront that, you know, hey, I get the pool that I'm trying to play in and I realize how special you are and I want to be really respectful of your expertise and your time and your abilities. Um, that's going to differentiate you because your competitor is probably sending all hundred of those people the same email at the same time in an email blast. So that alone is going to have you stand out. Awesome. All right. So, so assuming these, uh, these, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll take them maybe at the end. A lot of questions pouring in all of a sudden. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> now we've broken the ice with questions, right? So yeah, hopefully we'll have time to, to address as many as we can. And then I'll, I'll make myself available for some, some one-to-one, -one, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, okay. So now you've got them on the phone, right? Now you, you've managed to get them to take your call. They've answered your email. Um, how do we keep them going? Um, one of the, the mistakes I see folks in our industry make time and time again is we do two things in our recruiting call, in our sourcing call, if you will, our intake or whatever screen. We walk through their background and we tell them what's next. We say, okay, so you worked at Amazon for three years, okay, and you were promoted here and you did this, okay, uh-huh, okay, wonderful. So now I have it, oh, and what's your, what technology are you good in and how would you answer this question and da-da-da-da, okay. Okay, so now here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to present you to my hiring manager and if they like you, then we'll do an interview and then we'll do the, um, what does the candidate want? Why should I interview with you? If I'm a candidate and I've been a candidate and I've had exactly this conversation with sourcers who've tried to recruit me. And, you know, frankly, I don't have to explain anything to you. You called me. 
<laughs> right? I mean, my resume is out there, my LinkedIn profile, you can catch me on YouTube. You know, I mean, if you're talking to an in-demand research scientist who's one of a hundred in the, in the world that could do a job, that person is not interested in giving you a rundown of their resume and hearing what's next for them and the hoops that you're gonna ask them to jump through. Let them talk about what motivates them. Okay, great, we've, we've talked about your background. I see the, all the cool stuff you've done. What do you want me to know that helps the two of us decide how to best move you forward in your career? What's not on your resume that you want a hiring manager to know about, assuming that you're interested in having a conversation and moving forward? Why would you leave this amazing company you're at right now? It sounds like you're doing super cool stuff. I, I talked to a, a young lady, this has been years ago, one of my first data science hires at Microsoft actually, and she had done something like developed an algorithm that uncovered the risk of heart disease earlier and, and like patient mortality rates went way up. I hope I'm saying that right. Anyway, people were living longer and, and more often because of the work she'd done. And, whoa, mind blown. So why give that up? Like, that sounds so amazing. That sounds like you're doing something super impactful. What would you need to see in your next role, whether it's Microsoft or somewhere else, to make that change? And so letting her speak and letting her talk about things that she felt were missing or things that she wanted to learn or, or places she wanted to go, I was then able to take those notes keep track of that so that as we got on to our second, third, fourth call, get through the interview, get to offer, we could revisit. We could go back and say, you know, you told me it was really important for you to get back home. You've been living, you know, 500 miles away. You've been working at this university. You really want to get back to Seattle. Um, is that still the case? So think about um, just uncovering their motivators. It's okay to share your own. Hey, look, my goal is to get you on the phone with the hiring team. Hey, my goal is to get you through the interview process. Hey, my goal is to get you an offer. So it's okay to, at each step in the process, start thinking about um, how do we get to the next step? What is the next goal? And really just take the process one at a time. So quick, super quick pause. Any questions on that? Uh, okay. We're going to jump right into process. Oh, I'm sorry. If we have a question, I'll take one. <laughs> Tons and tons of questions. It is becoming very difficult for me to actually. Yeah. Any, mini, mini, most big one. <laughs> okay, so Andrea asked us, uh, "What's your opinion about reaching out to many potential candidates from the same company?" Also, I'll give you one more question. Yeah. So oh. Think about the same. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, reaching out to developers at conferences and seminars? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I mean, the, the the answers are overlap for sure. I think anytime you're addressing a large number of people at a particular company, I, I actually am guilty of this. Um, the message wasn't great. And one of the engineering directors was kind enough to call me and say, um, I just want to tell you that you look like an idiot. <laughs> he was very nice about it. But he said, seven of us got this message from you. We all compared notes, like, let me help you. <laughs> and I never did it again. <laughs> um, they will talk, they are friends. They're spending 10 hours a day next to each other. Um, personalized for each person. And it's probably okay to say, hey, you know, I'm reaching out to a lot of folks in your similar position, you know, just FYI, like I, I'm casting a bit of a wide net here. Um, you know, that that's okay. I mean, when we pretend that they're not onto us and they don't know how we work, we just look silly. So um, yeah, I think it's okay to do that, but just, you know, do it honestly and transparently, but still trying to be super hyper personalized to the individual. Um, conferences, things like that. I, I, I get, I, I will, a couple of ways to look at this. Um, as a presenter at conferences, I will often leave the stage and there's a line of people that want to talk to me. It feels really good. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like it's humbling and holy crap, people want to hear what I have to say, but it's also exhausting. Like I, I'm tired. I just expended 45 minutes of energy on stage and that's nerve wracking even for me. And now you have questions and now I think my brain's going to explode because I'm secretly introverted. You may not know that about me, but 
it's true. Uh, and it's a lot. So pick your time. <laughs> Please be, be careful of when you're approaching someone. Um, I think also approaching somebody just very briefly, like, hey, I heard you said this thing, or hey, I'm glad I ran into you here. I'm a recruiter. Here's why I want to talk to you. Here's my contact info. Please, you come to me when the time is right. So be bright, be bold, be gone. That's my advice. It's perfectly appropriate and it's it's perfectly normal to go to people where they are, but do it in a way that is as non-intrusive as possible. So with that, piggybacking quickly onto process because this is all part of that right this is the finding this is the getting them involved this is getting them um into the the steps um you know again i work for a company that is pretty well known for its um shall we say challenging interview process <laughs> having survived the interview process um, at my organization i can tell you it wasn't uh, wasn't a walk in the park but great experience. Obviously, I'm here, so that's all good. Uh, but really, our job, especially for technical talent, is to be their advocate. And, and I always tell folks, like, I'm going to be your interview Sherpa. I, I'm going to get you through this process. I can't interview for you. I can't give you the answers, but I can help you understand what's next. I can help you really be aware of timelines, be aware of um, what to expect what are certain pitfalls we do a lot with interview prep as well so if your company is not doing that i definitely recommend take some time to put together an faq a cheat sheet uh, maybe answer some quora questions there's lots of ways that we can help equip people for a process that quite frankly can be really mystifying we live and breathe interviews all day every day a software developer who's been sitting at the same desk for five years and who was a beast at writing code is probably terrified. It's probably taken them a lot just to get into the headspace of going on an interview. And then knowing like, here's the daunting process I have to go through. It's overwhelming at best. And a lot of engineers and, and tech folks that I've talked to just don't want to do that. That it's just not worth it. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of interaction with people and, and sometimes they just don't love that so you know really be mindful of what are they experiencing as they're stepping into this process and how can we help make it smooth so one thing i i really want you guys to take away from this is the idea of emotional currency every person that enters into this process with you no matter how easy or how hard it is has a payoff that they're looking for I will tell you with full transparency, I interviewed at Google because I had a bad day at Microsoft. I was feeling crappy about myself and I wanted someone to stroke my ego. <laughs> that was it. I just wanted someone to tell me I was pretty and I was a good recruiter, figuratively speaking, of course. Um, so the emotional currency for me was I just need to know that there's another option out there. I just need to know that after all these years at Microsoft, I can do this somewhere else and I can, you know, be recognized for my abilities and, and those kinds of things. Obviously, as things progressed, my emotional currency shifted a little bit, but it really started from just, God, I feel kind of crappy and I need to make myself feel better. Everyone's going to have their own thing. It might be money. It might be location. It might be, gosh, I've been writing the same code and keeping this legacy tool alive for 10 years and I'm bored. It could be that. You're going to uncover that as you're going through the screening process, as you're asking those questions, you're listening more than you're talking. Um, make sure you're tracking those things. And that's the emotional currency that you want to build. Those are the deposits you're making into your candidate's bank. Um, another thing to be mindful of, timing. Timing and deal breakers. Uh, again, I work for a company that has a very lengthy process from start to finish, and it's something I lead every conversation with. Okay, so we're at this step. We still have these steps to go. How's that look? How are you feeling about it? Are we still on track for a mid-August decision? Whatever it might be. So make sure you're kind of sanity checking with any of those other deal breakers, or if you get into things like level and title, like as more data starts coming and as more information is now available while you're going through this process, make sure you're not hitting deal breakers or make sure you're moving roadblocks for your candidates. 
compensation. Who likes to talk about money on the first date? <laughs> Very few people, I know. Uh, there's usually two camps. Usually you have recruiters, so, you know, some recruiters will put that stake in the ground and say, I'm absolutely not talking to this candidate unless they give me their yes number. Or you have other recruiters who avoid it like the plague until it's too late. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to be somewhere in the middle. My personal script, hey, money's important even though we've uncovered all these other things and we figured out your emotional currency is this and, you know i know all this stuff about you i also know that you're not going to do it for free i know that at some point compensation is something we have to discuss you are certainly if you're comfortable able to give me any information you want me to have today this is the first conversation this is the first call uh if there's something i should know you want 1.5 million dollars um you should tell me that because i'm going to tell you that it's not going to happen here <laughs> at this level or whatever and let's keep in touch um or you can just start thinking about it so start thinking about as you learn more about the job as you learn more about the company i want to make sure we're putting together an offer that you can feel really good about accepting most of the time, candidates are either going to respond with some information that's helpful to you, like, hey, yeah, actually, I'm making X now. I really don't want to make a change for less than Y. Or at the very least, they're going to say, thanks for bringing it up. I definitely want to you know, give it some thought. I don't want to share anything today. But yeah, it, it is important. We do need to talk about it. So you're setting the stage for the important actual numbers conversation down the road. All right, closing. How many recruiters, show of hands, I won't be able to see you, but just you'll know. <laughs> How many people make an offer or refuse to make offers that don't get accepted? Every time I hear this, and I, I get it occasionally, and, and it's, it's fascinating to me, but I do hear occasionally where a recruiter will say, oh, I'll never make an offer that doesn't get accepted. I pre-close. I know exactly what they want and, and I just won't make an offer. I won't give somebody this information unless I know they're gonna say yes. To which I would say, you are kind of a jerk. <laughs> um, I understand the logic behind it. I, I understand, especially for companies where maybe there's a lot of work to put together an offer letter or there's you know approvals, things like that. Like you wanna have an indication that the person's in. But I think by demanding an answer before I have a chance to see it, feel it, marinate on it, discuss it with people important to me, I can't make you any promises on something that I have not yet seen, absorbed, and thought about. So with that in mind, again, remember, candidates are still tuned in to that same old station, WIIFM, what's in it for me? You've looked at all the motivators, you've figured out the emotional currency, you've followed along every step of the way, you've learned things about the candidate as they've gone through the process, the hiring team has hopefully been well involved, things like that. Now it's bringing that all together into a final, okay, here's the package, you know, here's the exact job you're going to be doing, here's the team you're going to work with, here's the money we're going to pay you to do it, and guess what, it doesn't have shit to do with you as the recruiter. It just doesn't. It is not about you. I have never in 20 years of recruiting had a candidate say, you know, I only took this job because you gave it to me. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd that anyone would think that. Candidates are going to do what is in their best interest. They just are. It's our job to understand what is in their best interest from their perspective, what's important to them advocate and influence where we can. Sometimes people have misconceptions. We can kind of help maybe turn their thinking a little bit in a way that's beneficial for them. And then finally, create an, an opportunity, an environment that they can feel good about saying yes to. It's not just about the money. Not every offer is created equal, you guys. It, it's even in a competing offer scenario, and I've been in this situation where, look, you're getting x amount of money from facebook i'm offering you x amount of money like those amounts are you know everything else being equal like they're pretty spot on but what is the job when you show up on monday what are you going to have your hands on what are you going to be doing 
How does this affect your home life with your commute? Um, what is the growth potential? What can you learn? Those are the questions I want you guys to think about asking and start digging into. And again, we're digging into this the whole way from start to finish. But now that it's real, now that there's a letter in your hand, now it's really important to say, look, you told me that these things were important to you. Am I offering you those things? Or is the other company offering those things? And I say this all the time, I'm gonna take off my Google recruiter hat and I'm just gonna be a career coach to you. Based on what you've told me, this is the right thing because, or you know what, you should take that. It's a difficult conversation. I don't like losing candidates. I don't like saying no to people, but there are unfortunately parts of the process where we have to do what's right for our company as well as for our candidate. So something to think about. I know that's probably gonna spur a lot of questions. <laughs> So we can definitely, um, I, I want to keep us on time. If there's one burning question about closing, I can take it or, or we can, you know, hop through these last couple slides and then have some good Q&A. Uh, okay, so All right. um, how do you do do <laughs> back out? Uh, what was, uh, one more time, it cut out a little bit. How do I deal with what? Last moment back out. Okay, so these things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, they do happen and it sucks. Um, I would, first of all, I, I would, my initial question would, I'm assuming this is where somebody said, yeah, I'm going to take the offer and everything is good and I like it. And you've met my number and then I give them the offer. And then next thing you know, they say no. Right. Is that, is that kind of the, the situation? Mm, yes, I'm going to assume I get it is. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I think first of all, um, you, it's going to happen because again, people are doing what's in their best interest. Um, I would definitely want to post-mortem this a bit and say, okay, did I ask all the right questions throughout the process? Normally, when I've been declined, I cannot think, at least in the last five years, when a decline has surprised me. There, there's always signs. I think sometimes we're really good at pretending they're not there. <laughs> we don't want to see that. We don't want to think. Um, but when I've seen these happen, especially for, I mean, look, if you're not asking the right questions up front and you're not digging the motivators and you're not digging the currency and, and all those things, um, that's going to increase your odds of a decline. So I would say, first of all, don't take it personally because it's not about you. No one is turning down a job because you were a jerk. That's not, that doesn't happen either. <laughs> they may not take your call because you weren't very nice, but generally speaking, if they've gone through the gauntlet, it's not because of you. Um, but I think the important thing though, to, to really get to the point of your question is let me think about how this could have gone differently. Um, first of all, you want to uncover whatever you can. Was there a last minute competing offer? Was there social pressure from friends, family, et cetera, that, that might have caused this person to do something different? Uh, was there simply fear of change? In the case of a counter offer, a lot of times it's, hey, I'm super comfortable. I don't, I don't want to take a new job right now because now that it's real, I'm terrified. Um, so it's okay to kind of, first of all, ask those questions, but then really try to think about, okay, here were the things that I missed or here are the things that maybe I didn't catch when I had these conversations. So, okay, I'm going to use that in my next call. I'm going to remember this lesson and, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep moving. But again, the number one thing, don't internalize it. It happens, happens to me, happens to my company. Um, so you're in great company, but learn what you can from it. Move on. I'm not a fan of holding it against people, honestly. There's a lot of chatter sometimes in recruiting groups about, oh, well, I'm gonna blacklist that person and they're never gonna work. That is dumb. I mean, that that's just inappropriate <laughs> and rude and unnecessary. So take it as a learning opportunity, wish the person well, and then move on to your, you know, your next candidate in line. We we all have hopefully a large number of folks that we're networking with and talking with. So, okay, I wanna be really mindful on time because I think we're, we're actually kind of technically at the end of our presentation, but there's a couple more slides and then I want Q&A. Um, everybody's a recruiter. So again, hard lesson for me to learn. I really wanted to own it and I didn't want anyone to see how I was making my sausage, but here's the reality. We are all responsible for bringing people to our organization. Every single one of us as advocates, as employees, as shareholders, 
we all have a stake in building the right team. Nobody more so than hiring managers and the teams that they're going to work with. So when you can leverage them, who do you know? Who did you work with in the past? You'd love to see again. Who do you think might be ready for a change? Who should I contact? What conferences should I attend? Where do you people hang out? So getting into creative networking and social media. Um, is it is it NIPS? If I'm going after computer vision people, I probably want a booth there or I probably want a presence there of some sort. Uh, things like that. So think about where people are. Quick example, and then I'll keep things moving. I recruited technical evangelists for a hot minute at uh, Microsoft. And through the course of conversation and, and finding a few and talking to them, these guys are all over Twitter. Who knew? I wasn't recruiting on Twitter. I wasn't sourcing on Twitter. I figured it out since then. But at the time, it would have never occurred to me to go after people on Twitter. But that's where they are. So reach people where they are. Not everybody's on LinkedIn, not everyone's responding to emails, but if people are heavily involved in local meetups, in hackathons, in industry conferences, they're big on Twitter or GitHub or whatever, um, go to them there. Don't expect to find everybody on LinkedIn listening to your crazy email. So that's a, another quick thing. That's, that's a whole other webinar <laughs> that we could talk about. And then closing strategies. How did we get here anyway, right? What got us to this point? I made a massive hire just a few months ago. I mean, just a phenomenal, like talk about a big fish. Um, and the reality is I would not have been able to get this individual if not for the efforts of my hiring manager. He was so closely involved and worked so closely with me, jumping on champion calls with the candidate. Like he was super, super involved. And that is what kept this particular expert in machine learning really engaged and interested in our role. So you better believe when I got to the close and I'm making an offer, the first person I called was, hey, hiring manager, I'm about to make this offer. The minute I do, I want you to have that email queued up and hit send, okay? Because we're doing this together. And through those efforts, it did help influence our candidate to see, to see that, yeah, I am getting what I need here. And this is a big part of my decision. So. Um, metrics that matter, just super, super quick. We talked earlier about the funnel. You guys all know what that looks like. I, I want you to think about what you're tracking and why. Telling your story through data. And then I have a link here uh, to a blog post I wrote that, that actually goes into much more detail about this topic. So if that's something you're struggling with or you're thinking about how do I use my funnel data to drive different behaviors with my teams, uh, this is where you wanna go. And then finally, oh, we made it only three minutes over. We're ready for Q&A. <laughs> what do we got? No questions off the table. Uh, OK, so we'll give Amy a small breather. We'll let her maybe take a deep <laughs> breath and have a glass of water as well, since she's been speaking for, for uh, the last 50 minutes or so. So we'll give you five, two minutes, two minutes or so. Please, guys, uh, keep in two your minutes, questions. Two minutes, great. And here's a short video about what Hacker Earth does and how we can help your organization in recruiting the best talent. Perfect. Developers, the wizards that shape your company like nobody else. Their code helps build your products, develop systems, and keeps your entire technology infrastructure from falling apart. But hiring the right developers is a tricky task. You receive a lot of applications, but you only want the best. So how do you identify the best developers without spending a lot of valuable time on the wrong candidates? Introducing Hacker Earth's Technical Recruitment Software, a platform that helps you hire the best developers by using online tests to assess your applicants. Here's how it works. With Hacker Earth, you can invite candidates to remotely appear for customized coding tests for any technical role. And once they take your tests, you can access detailed performance reports to decide who makes it through to the next rounds. Auto-generate highly customized tests for any technical role, even if you're not a developer yourself. Access our library of more than 15,000 inbuilt questions or add and use your own. With over 35 programming languages supported, you can receive submissions in the language of your choice. The system magically evaluates the code submissions based on multiple parameters. 
and you get detailed reports on each candidate's performance. Copying or using any unfair means on a test is impossible thanks to our proctoring measures and plagiarism detection techniques. Hacker Earth helps you optimize your tech hiring process by scaling your hiring efforts, improving your accuracy, and reducing your time to hire. Tech recruiters use Hacker Earth for a variety of requirements, identifying the right candidates during lateral hiring, scaling their university recruitment efforts, and aiding workplace diversity through blind hiring. More than 500 companies globally use Hacker Earth to assess developers. Now, it's your turn to transform your hiring process. Register for a free trial today and try Hacker Earth now. So, yes, coming back, we're back with tons and tons of questions for sure. Oh, excellent. I love questions. <laughs> from Deeksha, she's asking how should a call be started by a sourcer? So it's basically about uh, reaching out to the potential candidates and how do you yeah. actually start off with the conversation with them? Yeah, so I would first of all want to clarify like has this person ever heard from me? Are they expecting my call? <laughs> so I'm going to assume not and then I'm going to assume yes. So I'll, I'll give you two answers. Um, if someone has never heard from me, I would simply say hey you've never heard from me before <laughs> um, i'm calling you about a specific thing i'm trying to solve this specific problem you look like the kind of person that might have answers for me um i'd love to just i'd love to see if maybe there's something that, that there's a fit here you know if, if you have ever and again i i come from a big company so it's easy for me to leverage that but i a lot of times i lead with i don't know if you're on the market i have no reason to think you would want to take this call but I do like what I see in your background. I am trying to solve this specific problem, whatever the business problem is. And if nothing else, I'd like to be your person if you have questions about Google. And usually that's enough information. I'm not putting them on the spot because they don't assume that, you know, I, I'm not assuming they're looking. It's giving them something meaty. It's like, oh, you're trying to stop people from making nasty comments in a YouTube feed. Okay, cool, I can visualize that. I can see what that work stream is. And then thirdly, oh, this person's actually offering to give me something of value. I have questions about Google. This is cool, I can ask this person. So it's a very non-invasive, like easy thing to answer. Um, and remember also that you're selling the next conversation. You're not calling somebody for the first time and saying, hey, I want you to come take a job at Google. You're calling someone and saying, hey, can I just get your interest in something I'm working on and maybe take 10 minutes to learn a little bit about you? Like, it's just that simple. I'm, I'm selling the next conversation, not the end of the process. Okay, so that answers the question. Also, guys, we're running a poll. It would be great if you could be a part of the poll. We have uh, four questions in this poll. We'll be moving on to the next question. Uh, okay. Perfect. So this question comes from... Amanda, and she's asking, what are some of your go-to topics you look for in a profile to hyper-personalize your outreach messages? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously being really respectful of what they've accomplished. I, I, I will, and again, I, I run through run this through my own experience filter for, for better or worse. I'm really annoyed when recruiters come at me for contract low-level jobs. What about my background tells you that I want to take a six month stint as a contract sourcer hunting for, you know, I, I like you're not, you're not even recognizing like what I've done. You should be like, dang girl, your blog's really funny. <laughs> or, you know, I mean, call out something personal about me. Like, oh my gosh, you have 72 patents. That's wild. How hard was that for you to get? How long did it take? So, so just being respectful of the stuff that people are proud of. I am incredibly proud of what I've accomplished. And so is that database developer and so is that research scientist so don't be afraid to be like that's super cool i'd love to learn more about how you did that or what you thought of the mba program at that school or whatever so 
it doesn't have to be like super weird, creepy stalker stuff. It can just be as simple as you've done some really cool stuff in your career. So kudos to you, by the way, you want to do it here? That's all. Okay, perfect. So the next question, uh, do you recruit differently for a contract temporary job profile as opposed to a traditional or a permanent placement role? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the way, and I haven't done contract recruiting in forever, meaning I haven't hired contractors. So clarify there, I haven't done it in a really long time. My assumption, and, and so please check me on this if I'm not getting it right, but my assumption is when you're hiring a contractor, you're looking for someone to come and do a function for a finite period of time. Um, that's gonna be a different conversation. And I think you're probably gonna to wanna to target people who have a history of contract work. There are people who love that. There are people who really enjoy coming in, doing cool stuff and then leaving, that's okay. But I think you approach them a little bit differently because you're not inviting them to a long-term five, 10 year career phase. So um, I think it's the question I would want to lead with is, you know, hey, it looks like you've held a bunch of contract roles. Is that by design? Is that you know, like, do you like contract gigs? Because I happen to have one that you might be interested in. And so it's okay to try to, again, uncover the emotional currency. Are you trapped in contractor hell and you want to get out? I probably don't have the right role for you. But if we can find out that, yeah, this is just how this person likes to work. Now you've got something to work from. Awesome. So moving on, uh, okay, so, okay, so how do you convince a role to an engineer keeping the brand apart? So I guess this is somewhere coming from, let's say a startup organization. And yeah, yeah. The company has multiple offers, let's say one from Google and one from a startup. So how do you make yeah. them join sure. startup as a big organization? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do I how do I pitch somebody on on a on a big uh, well known brand like Google versus a really cool sexy startup that just got like ten billion dollars in funding? Oh, has that happened to me this week? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, it goes back to that emotional currency, right? And so obviously we're making some assumptions here. We're assuming that the person's made it through the process. So everything is good. We we believe this person is. Um, right for Google, obviously the startup believes they're right for them. You gotta go back to all that stuff you've uncovered through every conversation. At this point, you've probably talked a half a dozen times or more. So, hey, we talked early on about stability. You know, you said that was important to you. Do you feel like this startup is set up for, you know, kind of that long-term potential? Or, hey, we talked about, you know, so it, it's kind of going back to what you have to offer. And frankly, I ask my candidates, I say, okay, you have all these offers. You obviously don't owe me anything, but I'm more helpful to you if I have information. So if you can just tell me what's on the table, what, what are you getting from this company? What's the pros and cons for each place? Taking my Google hat off, I'm simply being your friend and advocate. Let's really dissect what is giving you what you're looking for. You know what? Sometimes it's the startup. And that's okay, because let me tell you, when that startup either takes off and the person's ready for something new, or maybe it fails and they need a real job, who are they going to call? Me, because I was the one that treated them like an equal and like a valuable person with thoughts and opinions and needs and wants and helped them make the decision that was right for them, irrespective of whether I won or not. Uh, okay, perfect. So the next question, uh... In crafting highly personalized outreach messages, what exactly do you think is an ideal message length? Message length? I mean, I think it's kind of like resumes. Like, is it interesting enough for me to keep reading? It can be a book if it's a good one, <laughs> you know? Um, a lot of times I'll start with, you know, hey, I'm, I'm Amy from Google, obviously, like that's no secret, right? <laughs> uh, hey, I saw, I, I'm working on this specific thing. I saw this and this and this in your profile. Um, does it make sense for us to just have a quick conversation? Do you have questions that I can answer for you? So I think it, it's, it, the length is not something we should worry about. The relevance is what we should worry about. Am I giving this person enough of a picture 
to, for them to decide if they're interested or not. And, and I really wish that we could get away from this idea that we have to be really short and really pithy and really like not give up a lot of information because frankly, I don't want to waste six emails and two phone calls to find out that the job I'm offering has absolutely no interest to the person I'm talking to. So if I can kind of give you that upfront, be like, here's the specific thing I'm solving for. How does that sound? If it doesn't sound good, that's okay. We don't have to talk. I'm going to move on to the next person and you should move on to the next recruiter. So make it really clear, specific and relevant and people who are interested, which are the people you want, are going to read it. Perfect. So this question has been asked multiple times by different people. So they're asking, uh, don't you think uh, before you go ahead with the resume screening and further processes, uh, you should consider asking the candidate the compensation that they're looking for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I lead with that, like from the first, like, here's, I, I don't want to say the first conversation, right? Because the first conversation may just be, Hey, have you ever considered Google? Yeah, cool. Let's talk. Once we've decided that, yeah, I could see myself changing jobs. I could see myself starting this process with you at that point. Look, now that we're serious, like, we're kind of exclusively dating a little bit, if I can put it that way, there's going to be a price tag. And so I want to make sure that we are talking about comp. I want to make sure you're aware that this is a conversation we have to have sooner rather than later. I will also say, and this gets me in a lot of trouble with other recruiters, but I have no problem going first. I will tell you exactly what I think an offer might look like, depending on your interview performance, depending on the level we land at, depending on, depending on, depending on. I will give you a number. I will give you a range. I will give you information because I'm not afraid. I don't lose. The person who goes first does not lose. The person who goes first sets the stage for future conversations. That's winning in my book. Awesome. So, okay, next question. I guess that answers most of the questions that we have. Uh, moving on to the next okay. one. From your experience with the initial phone screens, how long should an ideal call be? I set mine for 30 minutes. Um, I know some folks will do it in 15. I'm not convinced that's enough time because I do want to sanity check. Like the purpose of the initial call in my world is I want to understand the person's background more fully so that I can map it to the job that I'm trying to fill or the team I'm hiring for or whatever. I want to make sure I'm able to explain process and next steps, as well as answer questions about process and next steps. And I want to make sure that I'm also able to really fully understand or at least start the conversation around candidate motivators. So approximately eight to 10 minutes each for each of those things is a pretty good amount of time. Um, the first conversation, you don't have to answer every single question, right? Because again, we're selling you on the next step, not on the whole process. But in that first conversation, it is absolutely critical for you to listen more than you're talking and to ask questions about why are we having this conversation? What is motivating you to talk to me right now? What can I offer you down the road that's going to make you say this was a good use of your time? So it's not just, oh, I see you've done all these things on your resume. And by the way, now I'm throwing you into the lion's den. It's going to be, okay, so for you to take this next call, what does that look like? And what do you need from me? And what questions do you have? And what's your motivator? So, so 30 minutes to me is ideal. Anything longer than that, then it starts getting a little too chatty and you're probably losing stuff. But th that's my recommendation. Awesome. So moving on to the next question. Uh Kelsey is having a doubt about, do you ha should we have aptitude test while uh, recruiting developers? Because it becomes uh, very frustrating for recruiters and hiring managers because they lose out on actually assessing the candidate on his skills. Okay, so are we are we talking aptitude test? I wanna make sure I'm, I'm understanding it correctly, like, like a personality test the or a skills test? test? something like let's say not basis the skill set that the person has let's say uh, testing their brains out also including these psychometric tests so i mean check yeah. <laughs> 
not a fan. Um, I know obviously every company kind of has their own um, perspective on this. I once did a, a one of these aptitude tests for an agency gig years and years ago and almost didn't get the job because they thought I wasn't money motivated. I, that's so far from the truth. How do you think I got into recruiting? I wanted to make money. <laughs> so um, not a fan. I would say if it's within your authority to do so, stop doing it. <laughs> but understand that there may be just processes you can't change or things that you cannot undo or reasons why your company or your your leaders think that this is important so in that case it's all about setting up an environment that the candidate feels comfortable jumping through those hoops um again i i mean i can kind of use my own company as an example like we have a lengthy process there are multiple steps for approvals and, and those kinds of things. And it's like, you know, once we get through those first few calls and we kind of unpack the motivators and those kinds of things, I need you to be bought in, in going through this process. It's just the way that we do our hiring. So if you have those kinds of steps and those tests and things like that, it's all about positioning how it's beneficial to the candidate or at the very least, just something we have to check the box so that we can get you through the process so again not a fan but i also respect that there's going to be things that we can't control and it's our job to make it a little more palatable awesome so garrick has a question for you as well uh asking, of course he does hi garrick <laughs> uh, how do you work against people who may only want an offer from you to get a better offer elsewhere what if you feel that the candidate is only fishing for a piece of paper from you? Why wouldn't they? Much? They're going to do what's in their best interest. Yep. If that's what they really feel is in their best interest, I, I can't stop it. I can't. And these are grown adults. I can't control how they behave. Um, I can tell you that I have halted interviews before and I have said, you know, I feel like this maybe isn't the right move for you or I feel like you're you're not necessarily like all in like tell me why, you know, you're investing a lot of time and effort into this process like what are you hoping to get so um, you know, you can uncover that, especially if you've been doing this as long as I have. You can read people relatively well. Um, I think it does go back to, hey, does the team really like this person? Do they really want them? Do we want to make, do we want to throw this Hail Mary? Yeah, why not? I've had offers declined before. It's not the end of the world. But I write notes. <laughs> That's a good answer. So yeah. <laughs> moving on, the next question from Colleen is, uh, what is your opinion on deadlines for accepting an offer? I don't like them. I don't like them. I don't. Um, I think it's reasonable to say, hey, within a reasonable time frame, we probably need to, you know, poo or get off the pot. I think that's fair. Um, I don't like hard closes. I don't like uh, pressure. Um, I will tell you, I, I had an offer once that was in someone's hands for 32 days. That is a ridiculous amount of time. But I will also tell you, he is currently working at the company I recruited him to, and happily so. So sometimes there's a happy ending. Um, I think it goes back to just setting expectations. You know, hey, this team, we're, we're at this stage now, we're making you an offer, we've talked comp, we've done all this stuff right. Um, I'm going to put a letter in your hand. I want you to have conversations with people you, that matter, the people you trust, your family, whatever, um, what is a reasonable time for you to decide? So push it back on the candidate first, and then you can react based on their response. So if a candidate's like, look, you know, I can't make a decision until I get these other three offers. Okay, so what are you gonna see in those other three offers that's gonna help you make your decision? Like what's the missing information right now that you don't have that would let you make a decision on this offer? So engineers are data driven technical folks typically are data driven they want all the information and they want to be able to slice it and dice it and do what's best for them um and then you know so to that end like i understand and i want to ask the questions and push the conversation that gets them thinking about okay well what really is the data that i need and then secondly you have to kind of look at each individual circumstance some candidates for some roles we can take the time 
we can give them the breathing room to vet the opportunity to have conversations with directors and VPs and to make sure this is the right role. Um, other candidates clearly like Eric mentioned, they're just hire kicking. And if I feel like, hey, you're just kind of messing with me to get a piece of paper, um, I'll need to hear from you in a couple of days. Otherwise, we're going to assume this isn't right for you. So not every offer and not every offer scenario is created equal. You have to use your best judgment and talk to your stakeholders and decide what's best in that situation. OK. So I mean, we were, we're already 10 minutes past our end time, but we don't want to questions <laughs> as long as Amy is comfortable with them. So. Uh, I'll, I'll just I'm happy to. Yeah, no, I, I just, I appreciate the conversation. Again, thank you to my friends at Hacker Earth for uh, for giving us the, the opportunity to have this this chat. I mean, you guys can always reach me at Amy. Um, send me an email, amy at recruitingandyogapants.com. It's my email address, so happy to, to chat more. But yeah, there's more questions. I mean, if you guys are good, I, I can hang out for a little bit. We're completely fine as long as you're speaking and we don't have to do much of the talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my superpowers for sure. I can flap my gums with the best of them. <laughs> okay, so one more question that has been asked multiple times is how do you call, counter yeah. uh, multiple offers? How do I, what was it? How do I what multiple offers? How do you handle counter offers? With lots of candidates. How do I handle counter offers? Okay, so yeah, so I think first of all, let's talk about the distinction between counter offers and competing offers. Um, counter offers is I'm going to stay right where I am and not make any changes. That typically comes from a place of fear, comes from a place of I didn't feel appreciated and now all of a sudden I do. Um, a counter offer is a slightly different emotional thing that's happening in most cases than competing offers. Competing offers, this is where a technical person, data driven as they are, is coming from okay i was the mythical passive candidate which frankly is a ridiculous term that i don't believe in <laughs> that's another webinar um you've now activated me so i am a candidate now for your company and i need more information so i'm going to go interview with everyone else who's calling me <laughs> and get a bunch of offers so again it goes back to first of all uncovering who else are you talking to? What stage are you at with these companies? What's appealing about those positions, roles, offers, comp, et cetera, to you? How does it compare to what we're talking about? So it goes back to really taking off that company hat and saying, look, I want you to do the right thing for you. I don't want you to take my offer only to um, go somewhere else in six months and now I have to do my job all over again. If I hire you for this role, I want this role to go away and not have to think about it until you get promoted, <laughs> right? Um, so being really transparent with candidates and explaining to them that you're not doing me a favor by taking my job just to leave in six months. So let's really talk about this upfront and make sure you're making the right decision. They appreciate that. And let me also tell you uh, related to this. And, and so the application here hopefully is clear. I had an engineering leader tell me once, this is someone that I, I hired. I, I was his recruiter when he joined my company. And he told me that over the years, as he's been in this very in-demand workforce, and he was an engineer for many years and has been a leader now for several years, that he would take so many calls from recruiters and get so many messages that he would have to remind himself like, okay, the recruiter is not reflective of the company. Okay, that's terrifying, <laughs> honestly, for a candidate to have to tell themselves, just because the recruiter's an idiot doesn't mean it's what it's like to work at the company. I do like the company. I do like the offer. I do. I can push past the recruiter and I can take this job. That is terrifying to me that anyone would look at me and think that. I want to be a positive um, example of what my company has to offer and I wanna be an advocate for my organization. So by being able to get human with people and really say, look, you've got a lot of great things in front of you. The reality is you're gonna be fine no matter what offer you take because you're that good. Let's talk about why you know, what matters to you? And then of course it's our job because we are paid by the company to make this happen, right? 
well, you know, but we are offering you this and you are going to get an opportunity for that. And so remind them of the things that are meeting the emotional needs of the person that we've talked about from day one. So again, you're not going to win them all. You're just not. And that's okay. Uh, there's a whole other discussion about offer declines that I would love to have at a future date. That could be maybe be another webinar. I don't know. But there's so yeah. much that we can learn from declines, especially the ones that are going to competitors. That's awesome. I mean, we, we, we have to have multiple sessions, I guess. We've had a lot of topics popping yeah. up. About <laughs> We've got a list. <laughs> we will get back to all of these sessions sometime later in the year. So, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, one question from Ryan. Uh, he says, yes. our recruiting team is having a really hard time just getting candidates into the funnel. We're not doing enough to get in front yeah. of candidates. Definitely need to be more creative, but how do you convince the business about investing in this? Yeah, so um, I think you need to be really clear in what you're asking for. That could be a sourcing tool, that could be additional heads, you know, maybe I need three more sourcers, um, maybe I need to divide and conquer my team, like I need clear standalone sourcers and then, you know, kind of back end recruiters that are finishing the funnel. Um, I, I tell you what, Ryan, if you want to email me, amy at recruitingandyogapants.com, we can talk about it. We can set up a one-on-one -on -one, uh, because I think the answer is going to depend on your specific situation and what you're asking for. But I think you need to be able to talk about that data. Like, look, we've talked to X number of candidates. Here's where we're losing them. So if we're losing them somewhere in the funnel, that's a conversation. If we're just not getting them in the funnel, which is what I think I'm hearing from you, that's really problematic and i would ask you where where are you where are we falling off are we just not finding people because our target audience isn't on linkedin yet somehow linkedin recruiter is supposed to be the solution clearly it's not because they're not there um is this you know so I, I think there's i think there's more questions i would have before i can give you a full answer but my guidance generally for for the audience is figure out where you're problem is your problem is not necessarily oh we're not talking to enough candidates it may be maybe i, I don't know but i heard that i got that message at a, at a previous company and they said oh we need to see more candidates and i said actually no you don't you've seen a, an increase month over month for the last three months and by the way your decline rate is 50 percent. so guess what the problem is it's not the lack of candidates so i would just encourage you ryan let's talk about it offline but let's really pick you know, kind of dig into um, where the gap is, and then I can give you a better answer. Awesome. So on to the next, uh, do you think that a hiring manager plays a more important role than a recruiter in the final hiring? No, I think they're equally important. Um, I think it's a team. I think it's a partnership. I think that we both have different perspectives. Again, I'm the recruiting expert. I know recruiting in and out way better than a hiring manager does. But guess what? Hiring manager knows building their team, the technology, the project, the cool stuff way better than I ever will. It's just not my wheelhouse. So both of us need to come together and be in lockstep. I need to be constantly updating my hiring manager. My hiring manager needs to constantly be updating me. We need to be a unified front. And I would say the same with sourcing and recruiting. I have uh, two specific sourcers that I partner with and we meet every week. We spend a lot of time together. We talk every day. Uh, we really have to be in lockstep and it's an equal partnership with, with all parties. Uh, okay, so I guess that answers the question. I mean, I can go on forever, I guess. I have like almost- I know, 40, 40, <laughs> we can go on all day. <laughs> So, I mean, I guess this is going to take the whole day if we take all of these questions. So we we probably we could make like a like an all day conference. We're going to need to get some tacos or something, though. I miss breakfast, so yeah, we're going to have to figure something out if we wanted to keep going. But no, I think um, you know I would just again thank you guys at Hacker Earth if you guys are struggling with your your validation and testing and and skills testing. I'm a fan of skills testing, not aptitude testing. There's a difference 
please check these guys out. I'm super excited to get a demo myself and, and see uh, see what they have to offer. Um, and I really appreciate you making this um, available to us in this platform and, and going 20 minutes over so we could have all these awesome questions. So um, appreciate you guys. Any Anything else that you want to talk about for a wrap? We're really glad that uh, you could take time out of your busy schedule and have this session with us. I mean, it's uh, something that we were looking forward to from a long, long, long time. And finally, we <laughs> arrive at this day and we're done with this. So I'll say that uh, maybe if possible, we'll send you all the questions by mail that we've not answered. I would love and that. We can share these uh, answers with all the people. I, I can see like tons and tons of more questions popping up till now. I mean, yeah, that'd questions. be amazing. Uh, we don't want to leave them. Yeah. Quick. We'll do one thing. We'll compile all these questions, send it across to you. Maybe you can take uh, the weekend and answer these because I, I i think it's gonna take a lot of time of your schedule as well so <laughs> yeah absolutely happy to do it that'd be amazing awesome so uh amy uh, a lot of people have been asking about your email id if you could just i'll, I'll just make you yes. the presenter so that they can actually see the email id as Perfect. well maybe note it down so i've made you the presenter yes now share your screen Okay, let me see. Can I? How? Where can I? Oh, oops. Okay, I think. Um, is there somewhere? Can I type it in somewhere here? Actually, let me do this, and then I'll share my screen. So if we go to, you're probably seeing this, and it looks really weird. And, bear with me oh of course we can't reach the page okay so here we go recruiting in yoga pants if you you can obviously get me here <laughs> at, at the on my my personal blog my email is amy amy at recruiting in yoga pants.com um my personal email as well is ala recruiter a l a recruiter at gmail.com that's also my twitter handle at ala recruiter so um any of those methods is totally fine you can catch me anywhere you can tweet at me you can message me um happy to keep the conversation going so yeah but please check it out uh, send me the questions i'm really looking forward to compiling those for you guys for hacker earth to get back out to the audience so yeah amy at recruiting in yoga pants.com and yes i'm wearing yoga pants because awesome. it's a work day and that's what i do <laughs> tony i guess we managed to answer your query as well so yep uh, we'll be sending the recording of the session and the slides to everyone who registered for the session as well along with that we'll also give you email Perfect. id that uh, amy shared so that you have an easy excellent for as well so I guess we're done for the day and we'd like to thank awesome. Amy first of all. I'll start off with Amy. Um, I mean, I fall short of words when I have to, you know, praise Amy for all the effort that she's put in for this session, taking out time on a weekday. I, I know Wednesdays are sometimes busy and I mean, taking out almost one and a half hour out of this uh, busy schedule is something that we would really cherish all our lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to the audience. I mean, we saw the, a massive audience out there uh, who were attending this live awesome. session. Thank you to you guys as well for taking time out of your schedules and being a part of this session. Uh, you can follow us at Hacker Earth on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, whichever social media platform you're comfortable with. We have more exciting webinars coming up and probably we'll have one more, one or two or three or four or maybe five of more with Amy <laughs> again, since we have tons and tons of topics. So, uh, yeah. It would be an honor. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, signing off. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Bye bye, you guys. Thank Hope you. Bye bye. Bye.